afternoon and welcome to the uh, February 21 board meeting uh, of the Board of Trustees for Johnson County Community College. We apologize for uh, my technical ability. I uh, was going to mute, we have two people on the phone today and I was going to mute them and uh, in my great wisdom I hit the wrong button that uh, Trustee Cross so nicely reminded me of that I pushed the wrong one. So, Nancy, are you there? Dick, are you there? We'll continue to work on it. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 This evening's visitors include Joseph Scarlett, Frank Harwood, Dennis Batliner, John Stewart, Rob, Roberta Eveslage, Lucas Gasconi, Katie Bergen, Brian Batliner, Blake Hoger, Ken Selzer, and Betsy Webster. Thanks for being here. Uh, awards and recognitions, Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, tonight, we recognize DeSoto USD 232. Not yet, not yet, Frank, no. <laughs> Each school day, DeSoto, the DeSoto District welcomes more than 7,400 students at seven elementary schools, three middle schools, and two high schools. USD 232 encompasses nearly 100 square miles in northwest Johnson County and draws from the communities of DeSoto, Shawnee, Lenexa, a portion of Olathe, and unincorporated areas of the county. The accolades received by the school district are significant. It leads Johnson County in high school graduation rates. It's placed on the National AP District Honor Roll. DeSoto and Mill Valley High Schools are among the best in the nation, according to US News and World Report. This all happens because of the leadership at the top. And tonight, we'd like to welcome Frank Harwood, Superintendent of Schools. And I'm going to give a little introduction here, Frank. Frank has served as Superintendent of Schools since July 2016. Harwood came to USD 232 from Bellevue Public Schools in Bellevue, Nebraska, where he served as superintendent for five years. Prior to Nebraska, Harwood ranked as an educator in Kansas for 18 years. He was the chief operations officer for Lawrence Public Schools for two years. In that role, he directed finance, human resources, facilities, maintenance, food service, transportation, and technology. Harwood earned his bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Kansas and is pursuing his doctorate in education through the University of Nebraska at Omaha. He is a member of several professional education and community organizations. While in Nebraska, he successfully completed the Midwest Superintendents Academy, a 10-month program designed by the University of Nebraska Omaha. Here at Johnson County, we're grateful for the partnership and the collaboration that we get to have with the US, with, with the SOTO. Frank, that's because of you. Um, we'd like to honor you tonight. So please, now you can take the podium. I do have to say that uh, DeSoto was a great school district long before I got there, so one of my big things is just not to mess anything up. Um, uh, USD 232 has a, has a great track record of some uh, outstanding performances by our students. Uh, that starts with a, with a really supportive community. Uh, and one of the things that helps us is our partnership with uh, Johnson County Community College and, uh, and the other districts in uh, Johnson County. Uh, some of the things we're really looking forward to as we uh, uh, embark on individual plans of study, uh, uh, individual plans of study for all of our students, uh, six through twelve, is helping those students articulate their plans for after high school. Uh, we think that's a really important thing to, to do, and Johnson County Community College is a big part of that. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, our new partnership with uh, JCCC and the KU Edwards campus in the Degree in Three program. Uh, we have, I should probably look the number up, but uh, uh, we have a lot of students that take advantage of the dual credit uh, programs that we have through JCC, and those are programs that really give our students a leg up when they, uh, when they move into uh, either the next phase of their life, whether that's uh, uh, additional education for the workforce. So we, we greatly appreciate uh, this honor and uh, look forward to many more years. Thank you, Frank. Frank, as a memento, we uh, present you with this appreciation and partnership uh, a clock. Uh, to remind us that uh, the time for teaching and learning is every day, uh, each day, 
and we appreciate the partnership and the good things you're doing in that developing, growing school district of yours. Thank you very, very Thank much. You. Next item on the agenda is the open forum. The open forum section of the board agenda is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, should be respectful and civil, and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion uh, processes or are otherwise the, the subject of review by the college or the board. Um, we do have, I believe, five or six speakers registered for this evening. Uh, when I call your name, come to the podium, and if you would state your name and address for the record and uh, try to hold your remarks to five minutes. First is Joseph Scarlett. Joe, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Scarlett, Overland Park, Kansas. This is actually the second time that uh, I'm speaking before this esteemed group. Uh, the first time, I think, it was the 10th year anniversary of uh, what used to be called Project Clear. Uh, I worked with Larry Devaney in the initial phases in the planning process of Project Clear. I was one of its first instructors. I also served as an adjunct faculty member uh, here at the college. Uh, I taught uh, regular educators introduction to the special education student. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'm a retired certified rehabilitation counselor and certified employment supports professional. Uh, anger, I guess, when I read the paper this morning. Uh, I remember a scene in, uh, in Lawrence of Arabia where the uh, British doctor when seeing the Turkish, the way the Turkish prisoners were being cared for, his two words were outrageous, outrageous. And that was my feeling this morning. The way that particular information was gathered is tantamount to a peephole in the ladies' dressing room at J.C. Penney's. And the article certainly is not going to win a Pulitzer Prize. I would expect something like that to come from Larry Pecker rather than the Kansas City Star. Let me tell you a little bit about Joe. And I've only, I only met Joe oh, when he was still developmental director. He wasn't president. And by the way, is it a prerequisite to be a president at Johnson County Community College? You have to wear a bullseye on your back? The, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to my uh, friends in Virginia, quit being cannibals and try cannabis. You know, in the, in the absence, in the absence, in other words, chill out. In the absence of uh, cannabis here in, uh, in, uh, in Kansas, legalized cannabis in Kansas, I would suggest maybe uh, going home and playing uh, uh, generally numb from uh, Pink Floyd or, uh, you know, to, to chill out. Anyway, I met Joe first. I had a young, uh, young man with, uh, on the autism spectrum in, in, uh, in tow and uh, went to Joe's office and asked him if he would provide an internship for this young man in, in, uh, the, in the business aspect of his office. I think it took him 10 minutes to decide yes. Uh, no, I take that back. It was only five minutes because when he found out the young man was a, a fan of, uh, of the Notre Dame 
uh, it took him a very short period of time to, to say yes. And that young man spent a lot of time, and it was a paid internship here on campus. So uh, there was no problems uh, as far as that was concerned. And Joe didn't know me from Adam. And I didn't see Joe again after that particular experience until I uh, ran into him at a, at a restaurant with his family. And I did call him once because I asked him if the Johnson County Numismatic Society could put a display up on the campus, and, and Joe opened the door for that. When you talk about diversity on campus, and there was some consideration of diversity on campus, all you have to do is ask the people who are participating in Project Clear or Clear and search, which is, now Joe didn't start those problems, but he hired the good people that did continue those particular problems. So I was gonna write down on the sheet of paper when I first came in here, WTF, and that's how I feel about this situation. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next item, John Stewart, next person, John Stewart. Yeah, my name is John Stewart. I live at 575 Mohawk Street, Lake Quivera, Kansas. And uh, it's good to see many familiar faces in the crowd. It's been uh, several years since I've been into this meeting. But Chairman Cook, trustees, staff, faculty, and visitors, I want to thank you for allowing me to make some comments. And I want to thank the trustees uh, for your service to the community. From my 11 years as a trustee, I know how hard you work. It's not easy, and you do have bullseyes on you. Uh, you spend hundreds of hours a year, and I know you contribute your own money because you're asked, you see these great projects on campus, you write checks, you go to events, so uh, you do a lot, and I, and I appreciate it. And I was always humored when someone in the community would come up to me when I was a trustee and say, how much do you get paid for that? And I would tell them uh, I was paid nothing. And most of the time they didn't believe me. They thought that I was doing this for a paycheck. And so I know you aren't, I know you're not getting one. So thank you very much for your service. Uh, I wanna thank you too, it's, it's hard to campaign, it's harder today than when I ran. Uh, you got a lot of things that uh, you have to overcome, you gotta raise a lot of money. and. And it's just a tough, tough thing, but I, we need good, good people like you, good citizens of this county to step up, to continue the leadership and the guidance for this college that's brought it to be you know, one of the best in the country over the last 50 years. We need the next 50 years to, to be like that. I've been actively involved and a supporter of Johnson County Community College for 39 years. It's hard to believe, but I, I started as a student here in 1980, and I see some of the student senate uh, back there. Uh, I actually was a student here. <laughs> uh, I was 24 year old with a family, and I had a dream to get a college degree. Uh, it was hard. Financially, it was hard for me. Uh, my family had to sacrifice and, uh, to, for me to achieve my dream, and, and uh, I worked almost full time while going to school here. I took out college loans, and I even received a Pell Grant, so you, that tells you where my income was. Uh, if you asked me back then, I would have been against an increase in tuition back then. I would have. It's like, hey, I can barely get by now. Why, how can I afford more? But over time, I've learned, and uh, older and wiser, I guess, that that sacrifice that I made and my family made was well worth it. And I valued my time here. Uh, I had skin in the game, and I did better. I, did, I was not a good student in high school. I, I didn't try. Uh, I went to sports and girls. And uh, I got to college, and then I'm paying, writing the check and paying for this, and I applied myself, and, I, and that caused me to, to uh, focus and do well, and I ended up achieving my dream of a, of a college degree. But I think tuition needs to increase over time as our expenses increased. Uh, I was involved heavily in the uh, financial side of the college when I was a trustee. Faculty and staff want raises, utilities and insurance go up, expenses go up over time. And I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that the direct beneficiaries, the students, 
should should pay it their proportionate share of their education. They don't pay for the cost of their education. They're paying just a partial amount. I think uh, I commend the president, Sopcheck, and the trustees. They put to, in place safety nets to help students in need. These, these are since I've been uh, on the board of trustees. Child care assistance and understand a meal sharing plan now for those that may not be able to afford meals. I think those are ways we can assist. And because of the great experience I had at Johnson County Q Community College, I, I have dedicated myself to raising money for student scholarships and programs. The reason I do this is try to repay the community for helping me become successful. I have a strong passion for helping those who are trying to help themselves. Raising money for students at JCCC makes sense to me. And I appreciate the passion that's been shown around over some issues here in the tuition. And I would like to ask those that have this great passion for it to maybe direct, write a check to the foundation for $30. That's about the average cost of the tuition increase for a year. That could pay for a student's tuition. Uh, the foundation has done an amazing job raising funds and, and giving money to those in needs. Uh, so I'm also here and I'm a strong supporter of President Sopcich. I've known Joe since the day he was hired here. In John, fact, you could wrap up with five okay. minutes. Is okay. I, uh, I've known him since then. He's helped raise millions of dollars for student scholarship, much of it directed to those students in need. Painting him as a person who does not care about those in need is not accurate. And unfortunately, we live in a time when you don't need to know the whole story to condemn someone. Recording a private conversation or releasing partial sound bites is deplorable, in my opinion. President Sopcich has dedicated his life to helping others in need, and particularly students at JCCC. And I applaud his service to the college and our community. Thank you. Thanks, John. Brian Batliner. Uh, Brian Batliner, 11420. Need the address still. Okay. <laughs> West 104th Street, Overland Park. Same zip code. 66214. <laughs> um, so there was a time when I was hoping I would not be back here to, to speak. Uh, it was actually just about two months ago. Um, I really felt that we had some phenomenal m momentum going with our Save the Track efforts, the ef efforts to reinstate the track programs here and have a, a meaningful discussion about what that opportunity meant to the community and uh, meant to the students and meant to, excuse me, to us as alumni. Um, unfortunately, I'm back. And the main reason I came back tonight was to, as we've done in the past, is to provide an update and kind of be on the public record as far as what our efforts have been. Um, so on January 3rd of this year, I was fortunate enough to have a meeting with a, a couple staff here at the college. Um, I'm grateful for their time. However, I was very disappointed with how that meeting went. Um, I entered the meeting fully under the impression that we were gonna have a discussion about meaningful ways that we could reinstate a track program here at the college and the number of people that would come to support that. We didn't really discuss that much at all. Uh, mostly we continued to discuss the reasons why we can't do that. And so that was really disappointing to me. Um, I've had coffee with a lot of you I've sat across from a breakfast table, and I'm appreciative of that time. Uh, I felt that we forged some, some really positive relationships, and it was a really hopeful time a couple months ago for us and our group, and a lot of people out there that have been watching this for, well, the last 14 months. Um, so, so very disappointed after that. Um, I did follow up, um, and, you know, I hate to pile on as far as reading statements that, that you know, were, were sent privately, although... I do think this, this is important to, to put out there. Um, I asked Dr. Sopcich directly, um, are we gonna have this serious discussion or are we not? And the response was, it's hard to say. The priorities for the upcoming budget are already set and approved for next year. At this point in time, there are no plans to initiate discussions about a new track for the upcoming, upcoming year. Please know I wouldn't have worked to encourage our trustees to meet with you or to set up the meeting with staff if I wasn't serious. I don't want to mislead you or to create expectations that something like this is a slam dunk. It takes time, considerable effort, and trust. Time, considerable effort, and trust. I, I threw my hands up to that email, to be honest with you. Because for 14 months, 
you've heard from us. For 14 months, there's been an effort from this community to be heard about why this program mattered. In March, 500 people walked the track here as a show of support for these programs. In, in August, there was a t-shirt campaign. We sent t-shirts all over the world to alumni, all over the country, literally. We sent shirts to Armenia. We had high school kids and high school coaches. We had people walk nervously to this podium time and time and time and time again and tell all of you how important this was and how we can support this in this community and how it matters to us as alumni. So I don't, I don't have a response to that email, I'm sorry. And so in light of, of recent events that I'm not gonna comment on right now, I just think it provides context. Um, our trust was broken when the track program was cut, okay? And it was a tedious, it's a tedious effort to rebuild that trust. And I believe that we were giving you that, that room. But action is what's gonna be, rebuild that trust in the end. It has to take action on the part of the college. And things like this, providing opportunities to, to students in this community to get a scholarship, to, to compete for this program, to compete for this college, that are a diverse background, that have you know, uh, unbelievable <laughs> reasons to um, uh, not go to school, but track draws them into this college, it's important, it matters, it matters to the alumni. Um, so I, I'm still really hopeful. In the end of the day, everything that's happened over the last year that you've heard from us on, that um, we've commented about, that we've fought for, um, I'm hopeful in the end that, that we can have a positive outcome to everything that's gone on over the last 14 months. We believe in this college. You know, our group has never been a bunch of wild, activists holding placards and screaming for people's jobs. That's not who we are. We're professionals in this community that went to this college, that graduated from here, that went on to get degrees, that now work here and raise family here, families here and have jobs here and contribute to this community. We want the best for this college. We have to have a meaningful discussion for how we're gonna do this. In the end, all of us will benefit. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Blake Coger. Everybody, Blake Coger, 24853 West 148th Court, Olathe. Um, couple, couple good speeches there, hard to follow up. Um, you know, I, I thought John said it well. I don't, I don't think anybody is, is doubting anybody's sincerity or kindness here. Um, <coughs> you know, I think there's a lot of frustration with a lot of issues, uh, and we've talked about those a whole bunch. I, I came up here in January and talked about some of those things. But as Brian tried to do and, and bring it back to the, the track issue, which is what brought us here and, and keeps us here more or less, um, it all feels like a very familiar situation, a, a familiar sentiment. For, for over a year, we fought for these programs. Um, we've, you know, at the bottom line, 60 plus fewer opportunities for athletes to get a scholarship and an education at Johnson County Community College, the kind of scholarship that I know impacted my life greatly. Um, I've told that story before. I've written that story on our website. We have literally hundreds and thousands of similar stories. Um, I can't tell you how many teammates I had that would not have been in college if it wasn't for the track program or tennis or golf or any of the other athletic programs that we have at the college, any, any program really that provides a scholarship. Um, but, but there's something about the track and field program. There's something about the sport. Um, that a lot of other, other programs just don't have in terms of that, that drive, that grit, that willpower um, to compete when literally every single fiber of your body wants you to stop and all you would, you, you would almost rather die than take another step. And I think that's indicative of why we continue to come up here every single month despite the fact that I really hate speaking in public. Um, but it's important to us because it affected my life. It affected my teammates' lives at Johnson County. It affected my teammates' lives at UMKC. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible experience. And so we're, we've been frustrated uh, that for over a year now, despite hundreds speaking, thousands signing our petition, writing into you all, coming up here and speaking, walking the track, we feel discounted and disagreed with nonstop. And, and it's apparent to me through a lot of this effort that you all really don't like to be disagreed with. Yeah. Um, and you see it that way. Rather than 
than taking it as an opportunity to listen, to learn, and collaborate with us, the alumni, or the community. We get, we get kind of shoved aside, and, and you all seem to take offense to what we say, and that's unfortunate, because quite frankly, there's nobody here that would rather champion the heck out of this college than us. We want to be your biggest supporters. We really do. We have ideas at the yin yang for alumni associations, uh, for communication efforts, things that we can do to really engage communities like ours. Um, and that's disappointing not to have that. You know, in the last board meeting, I was a little disappointed after I spoke, and one of the issues I mentioned was, was the mill levy. And I think I used the phrase, you know, giving, giving 2.6 million back to the taxpayers or whatever. It was kind of picked on a little bit after I said that. Um, I think it was inferred, you know, that Mr. Harris Webster, you know, he knew what he was talking about and I didn't quite know what I was talking about when I phrased it that way. That was a little frustrating to me because quite frankly, I've heard you all use that exact same phrase, giving taxpayer dollars back. Um, you know, Mr. Musil, you used that phrase in December if you want to look at the record. So you chose to respond in semantics rather than an actual relative uh, discussion there. It's not about a dollar increase in tuition. It's not about you know, cutting the program necessarily. It's not about the mill levy. It's all of these issues combined, and that's what creates the problem here, right? So anyway, that's it. Blake, thank you very much. Um, appreciate your comments. Ken Selzer. You can just step out. Maybe you can, yeah. Okay. That, uh, that concludes the open forum. Uh, we'll close the open forum, and we appreciate your comments. Next item is the Student Senate Report. Mr. Harris Webster. All right, hello, it's always a pleasure to come and speak before you all. Um, so yes, I have a report from Student Senate. So we're gonna be going, covering the fun things first, our budget allocations, remaining budget. Uh, we have a new club that I'd like to introduce to you all. Uh, we have a, new, a few new senators, which some of them are here tonight. Um, some clothing, pantry updates, and a tuition raise vote that I wish just to share with you all that Student Senate took. So Active Minds, we were able to allocate 82% um, of what they requested, which is like $1,562. Uh, so this is part of our primary responsibilities. So there you go. Need me to speak in that? No, I'm actually going to move. I feel like I'm not here. Just okay. Me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one of our primary um, objectives of Student Senate is to allocate funds and help sponsor other groups on campus. Uh, Pi Phi Kappa Honor Society, we gave them 95% of the requested amount. Uh, so some of their club leaders are going out of state on a trip where they're going to be able to present some of their work and just learn and um, develop some skills. So give them about $3,360. Uh, Honor Students Association, we gave them 97% of their requested amount. So a little over $1,000 uh, for a dinner that they're throwing. So we get our money from the student activity fee, which is the $7 per credit that's charged, and uh, we get $38,000 altogether. It's about 2% of the overall amount, but that's what we give to, uh, to student activities or student groups on campus. Um, you know, some of them are like Ultimate Frisbee, fun pizza parties, and then some of them are like uh, the culinary school on their trip. So um, right now, we're sitting at about $12,496, so. Yeah, that's where, just give you guys an update on that. New club, so Friends of Internationals. Our international club is the most active club on campus. They get 90 to 100 people. So this is a different club called Friends of International. They have connections um, in multiple different states, uh, which is fantastic. So we're hoping that through these connections, they'll be able to um, allow international students if they transfer to these places, they'll have like a connected group um, that they can get in touch with. So these are our new senators. Uh, I'm just going to ask them to, we have two of them in the back, if you wouldn't mind just standing real fast, just get recognized. So uh, we have Lisa. So 
Lisa's on my left and Sophie's on my right. So uh, Lisa's studying pre-dentistry. Um, Caroline, who's not here, is studying pre-law. She's the lady in the middle. And then Sophie's uh, pre-medicine. So yeah, thank you. I told them they each had to write a speech, but I'll just do it. <laughs> um, okay, clothing pantry. So really excited about this. Uh, just to reemphasize what this is, is it's business casual clothing for students who um, just need you know, proper apparel uh, for job interviews, um, or do they just, I mean, whatever they need it for, they're able to come and pick it up and we'll actually just give it to them. Uh, so we've already built an online platform. We are actually accepting clothes now. Um, Caleb is our vice president and that's his Stumel. Ann Turney's, who um, is our director. So you can contact her. We actually just received our first donation. Um, so if any of you have business casual clothes you wish to donate, Dr. Cook, I heard you have uh, quite a collection of boots. And, uh, <laughs> no. That's true, I do. Yeah, clear out that closet a little bit. Work. We'll be uh, happy to send some people over and help you with that. I will, uh, I will see that you get a pair of Yeah, them. I might even personally come over and expect some of those. So. Size you were, Tiger. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, yeah, I just wanted to share some pictures of the DC trip. It was so fantastic, and I just want to say it's such a ple pleasure to have been chosen for this, and just a real honor to represent the students. Um, I gave them all a student senate shirt. Uh, Pat Roberts, uh, Sharice Davis, and um, Jerry were in. So it was um, yeah, it was just a really great opportunity. I, I just wanted to share one story. So I walked out of Sharice Davis was the first um, congresswoman that we went and saw, and uh, once we finished finished, we, as I was walking out, I saw. Uh, President Joe Subject and Angelina Lawson scurrying and like running down the stairs. And I thought they saw someone famous because there's, you know, all these representatives and you're walking by these offices and they're like, no, no, we just, we just really want to go see Alexander Cortez's office. And they, we, they just, we, it took us like, I feel like 30 minutes to find it because we got lost in the tunnels underneath the Capitol Hill. But, That's enough, um, Tiger. We don't need to go on. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So they told me it was part of the experience. Uh, but yeah, so they, overall, I mean, it was just such a privilege to, help and uh, to talk to them about Pell Grants and uh, how much they benefit me personally because I'm a Pell Grant recipient, um, help me to be actually just continue being a student here and give time so I can actually, uh, you know, donate that time to Student Senate. So it's allowed, I think it's a, a lot of people just even on Student Senate, Pell Grant recipients and um, so it's just benefit a lot of people. So it's just a pleasure going into supporting that. So the tuition raise, so the official vote um, from Student Senate was that Student Senate was unopposed to the tuition rate. Uh, we had some people absent for this and they're not counted there. So we had 14 um, in favor and two against and one abstention. Um, so yeah, just wanted to share that all with okay. you. Thank Before you, you leave, to, are you finished? Yes, yes. Before you leave, uh, Lisa and Sophie, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy by the name of Paul Harvey, but he... Um, <laughs> He, he had a moniker of now the rest of the story, and I don't know if Tiger has told you the rest of the story, but he was so moved, he's filing for a position in the Congress and wants one of you two to take over the Senate position <laughs> next month. <laughs> he hear you were a rock star in Washington, so uh, what did you learn? Why is Tiger Harris Webster different today from that experience? Well, I mean, it was, it was just interesting. I mean, you have like a, you know, I've, Flying into D.C., the only um, conceptual reality I know is from House of Cards. So, I mean, it, it was just, you know, it was just a real friendly environment when, to, when you're in there. And it was just, a, it was so sur surreal just to actually just be talking to the people that represent us all. And um, uh, I guess it just kind of took away the fantasy of, you know, how the TV shows perceive it and just made it just actual and real. I mean, um, and I don't know, it just made me feel just made me feel a lot more secure and uh, just not like there's just these superb people that are just, you know, overseeing everything. It was just like, oh, we're all just people here in this world and just trying to help each other. So, um, yeah, just really great insight. Uh, I was nervous at first because the only advice I got was like, when as soon as you walk in there, it's like shooting off the hip. You never know where it's going to go. Yeah. So, I mean, um, but after after meeting with them, it just felt it just felt really great. So. Well, thanks for your time and going there. Uh, and, uh, Tiger, of the two senators and congressmen, which one was your favorite? Oh, man. Well, well, uh -oh. You don't have to answer that, Tiger. You can take the Fifth Amendment, Tiger. Well, okay, there's favorite aspects of all of them, but I have to say the most, I'll, I'll say this, uh, the most interesting one was Pat Roberts, just from the, we got to see 
some pretty cool stuff that he had. Um, <laughs> the ashtray. Yeah, the ashtray from, <laughs> who was it? That, Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. Yeah, it took us, I felt like forever, like 10 minutes to figure out what that thing was. And the only hint he gave was tapping on it. And uh, apparently that's where his cigars went. But uh, you, you did really good, if I may say, Mr. Chair, uh, with Senator Roberts, with everybody. Uh, Senator Roberts wanted to wax uh, really philosophically, I felt, about uh, the status of world trade, the importance of trade with China. And um, we, we were encouraged by Dr. Sopcich and others to really just let the member or the senator take, mm -hmm. take control and talk about what they wanted to talk about. And Tiger does great just sitting there listening to Senator Roberts talk about all these things and about how Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un, uh, and it's not good to trust one man or one person. Uh, they don't have all the ideas, like we need to work together. Mm -hmm. Really a positive spirit I felt uh, with the, the budget deal being reached that week. So all we had time for with Senator Roberts was for Tiger to talk. <laughs> so Tiger was really our sole uh, vehicle to get our message to Senator Roberts. So you did great. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Any other Thanks comments? So Questions? Thank you. I'm free next job. year, by the way. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks good luck in your campaign. Uh, next item is the college lobbyist report, but I have to explain what I did. I, I heard papers rustling, and I, it's, it's loud, and I thought I hit the mute button, and yet I hit the disconnect mute button, and we've lost them forever. But I think if we can uh, move that item down a little bit, do you want a 15-second break? Right let's, let's take a technical adjustment time here. Sorry for you and the uh, television audience. Everyone here knows James Drone. James, would you like to address the, the group? <laughs> Working on the polycom. <laughs> Nancy there? So he said okay, he's getting ready to call now. How about Nancy? And I just texted her if she's Okay. Hello? While you work on that, let's move that down. And uh, Trustee Lawson, if you could do the human resource uh, part of the agenda. Are you doing the collegial steering one? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah, thank you. I'll do college lobbyist report. That's next. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, the, um, I mean the collegial steering. Yeah, collegial steering. Get squared away here. We met uh, on uh, Tuesday, February 6th. We had four items that we talked about. Uh, the first was the student agency project, and uh, we probably spent uh, a third of the time uh, discussing student agency. Uh, student agency is a program where students can be mentored by faculty in partnership with business, uh, businesses in the community for uh, on-hands experience uh, through the Small Business Development Council. And uh, Karen, if you could do a... Uh, 30 or 45 second commercial on just exactly what is student agency. I, by the way, in, in, um, in collegial steering, it's made up of uh, educational affairs, faculty senate, faculty association, administration, and trustees. And I thought there was really good dialogue about everybody trying to understand what, where we were with the student agency and how that impacted uh, faculty and students. So if you would, please. Sure. And you can jump in, Mickey, too, if I miss any pieces of it. But basically, the way the agency account was set up, I see Kate back there as well, too. Through the foundation, they have funding to assist with faculty that are involved in the project. We work with the project um, by using our entrepreneurs through our small business development center and then bringing a student in to work on projects within those companies. So it, it gives student real, ex, a real experience, uh, paid internship time to be there, as well as faculty being involved with funding as well. And of course, it really supports the small businesses who have different initiatives that they're working on, whether those be a marketing initiative or something IT related. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, the other, another item was the Banner 9 program, and uh, uh, 
it's, it's really a, 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 a software program of course descriptions and how we track course descriptions and how we make that information available to students. And Vicki, could you do a 45 second commercial on Banner 9 and where we are with that? Uh, Banner 9, as we have moved into it this year uh, at the behest of our vendor who's moved to a cloud centered where everyone in the nation who uses Banner is on Banner 9. Um, we've experienced some changes because our legacy system allowed us to um, move some things around in terms of course descriptions to put some things on the front page that is not designed in the current program. And so we have changed the functionality of what um, faculty and staff have become accustomed to as well as student ability to see certain pieces of information about classes uh, and books on that front page. Uh, the information is still there but it requires some drill down. And so what we're looking at right now is if there is a solution for us to try to both work with Alusha and the company that owns Banner to provide some of those pieces back to us, as well as how we can um, leverage the legacy system that we had in place to maybe keep some of that functionality <laughs> available for deans and faculty to be able to track some of the information that we use um, in the diligence of our duties. Good, thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, we also talked a little bit about curriculum. We were running out of time. We try to keep our meeting to an hour. But the curriculum issue has to deal with moving from a 16-week semester to a 15-week semester and some adjustments uh, when we moved to that 15-week semester in the fall of 2020. So um, uh, that, that, that discussion will continue uh, uh, at our next meeting. We also talked about communication. And as we've seen, communication is something that we all need to work on every day. Uh, our focus on communication in that regard was um, uh, the engagement of all the, of the faculty, Senate Association, Ed Affairs, when we talked about the uh, student agency program, the Banner 9 program, and I think we talked a lot about how we can be more inclusive of the people that use Banner, well, all the faculty, uh, in, in getting a solution that's helpful for everybody. So communication will continue to be a, an item on our agenda as well. And uh, we had a really nice, productive uh, meeting, I thought, and I always judge it how quickly it goes. And, of course, it, it, we, we had a little weather issue developing that night as well, but uh, we had a really, really productive meeting. Dick Carter, are you there now? Yes, can you hear me clearly? Yes, the reason I tried to mute you is I think you were rustling your papers and it was a little bit distracting, so if you can keep your papers quiet and your, your oration loud, we are ready for your report. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> February 28th is the House of Origin deadline, and uh, that means that all bills that started in the House move to the Senate, and all bills that started in the Senate move to the House, and vice versa. And uh, after the legislators complete that deadline turnaround, they'll take a little break until March 6th. And so uh, session will, will be out. Uh, committees won't be meeting uh, for those, those few days that legislators are, are on their, their first little break. The January revenues were down about 51 million from what was expected, uh, and, and so that kind of plays into this larger question of where are we going with various significant budget items, such as K-12 budget, uh, the increase for higher education. Uh, the governor has some other things that have a significant cost to them as well in, in our budget recommendations, and so all folks connected to the budgets are, are watching that very closely. The House Higher Ed Budget Committee did increase from the governor's budget recommendation to the amount of $10 million for higher education, and that would be uh, spread across the system. And so whatever the formula uh, that the Board of Regents would use, that money would be uh, parceled out to all of higher education. So $10 million doesn't go very far, but it is $10 million more uh, than what, what the governor uh, recommended in her initial budget. Uh, that report was to the full House Appropriations Committee this morning uh, at 9 o'clock. And uh, there were a couple of other things that were added into that budget. One is uh, just a, a proviso or a comment, if you will, um, that the regents are to come back with a plan to lower cost of students and lower student debt for the next legislative session. That really is a charge just to the state university, but it, it, uh, it's something that, that we'll note uh, at least moving forward. Uh, there was also an attempt to add an amendment that would um, recenter uh, some of the CTE programs uh, for community colleges. That amendment went on, but with a qualification that uh, they come back and sort of further define just exactly 
what is meant by that. So we'll see that that would actually uh, add some dollars to the, the JCCC budget as well for some of those courses. But we're not exactly sure where that fell. It was very confusing even for committee members as they were talking about it. The Senate Budget Committee do not meet until the second week of March, and we'll go through this entire process all over again, just like we went uh, through the House. Um, a couple of other issues I'd like to talk about. The first one is papers. Again, the reason I want to discuss that is because that plays into the whole budget discussion. The Senate passed its version, which would be a $115 million transfer from the State General Fund to the CAPERS Fund, and that makes up that 2016 missed payment along with interest. And so it's simply transferring $115 million in existing or current resources uh, over to CAPERS. Uh, the governor's plan was to reamortize CAPERS bonds over a 30-year period, uh, freeing up some additional money to be used for budget items. That plan um, met with immediate uh, negative reaction when it first came out of the, of the uh, gate, if you will. But the House <coughs> did debate that plan last week, and it was defeated. Uh, that, that effort was defeated. So today, the House took up Senate Bill 9. It made its way through the committee in the House. And uh, it passed the House on a voice vote on general orders and will be uh, voted on in final action tomorrow. So again, that will be $115 million out of, out of the existing resources budget um, instead of uh, re-amortization. Dick, while we're on that, Dick, like Dick, can I interrupt you there? Uh, while you're on that point, what was, what was the total amount again of that loan? Do you recall? For, for re-amortization purposes? The, the loan from CAPERS that went into the general fund, what was the total amount? It was more than 150. Wasn't it more than 115 million, though? That was, that was, the, that was, the, missed, that was the missed payment in 2016 plus interest. Right, but so, do you recall what the total amount okay. of the transfer was originally? Anybody remember what that? It's was? An you bonded a billion, right? With a B. It was a one and a half billion, I think. Okay, thanks. That's they the number I'm looking for. Bonded to fund Gapers. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry. Go ahead. is uh, the uh, issue around House Bill 2144. That was a bill introduced by Representative Williams uh, from Butler County, uh, and it is a not it is a non-committee bill and a, and a non-exempt bill. Um, that bill uh, provided for a number of issues related to transparency, posting on websites, printing in newspapers, but it also had a component that would remove local control uh, by, by putting in a protest petition, uh, which some people are calling uh, essentially a tax list. Um, KACCC opposed that original uh, legislative hearing. We were a part of the KACCC testimony, and I, and I attached that to my report, so you should have that. That bill was worked today in committee, and Representative Williams had an amendment that essentially struck the the portion that was, was most offensive related to local control uh, and, and any budget issues and made it only a transparency bill. Um, there still are some concerns. That bill did pass out of committee uh, on a vote of 10 to 5. Uh, I think that there's going to be some procedural efforts to, to bring the bill back to committee and maybe readdress some of those, those issues that were concerning. Uh, related to how, what was included in the transparency. Again, our college is already putting most all of those things online or are part of the region's big data book already. So there's lots of redundant efforts here, but I think the bill is in a much better position than it was prior to today's hearing. So that's kind of where things are at, um, specifically with issues related to the community college. And I would stop there, uh, Trustee Cook, and see if there's any questions. Questions? Yes or no? I see none. Nancy, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, good. I'm sorry I cut you off. That was my fault. Do you have any questions for uh, Mr. Carter? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Just for the end of his... Are you are you done with your report, Mr. Carter? That concludes my report. Okay. Any questions? I, I would just like to comment on that on the House bill. 
that would have been a disaster for local control generally and particularly for us, one of the provisions was if you expend $250,000 on a project, you have to wait for a protest petition. And if there's a protest petition by 5% of the voters, which would be hard to get, you have an election. Our bathrooms, if they have multiple stalls in both men's and women's, are more than $250,000. And this was a local issue in Butler County that a local representative tried to break, bring statewide. And I was heartened by the fact that members of both parties said, this is a local governing body decision. And if you have a trouble with your local governing body, there are ways to deal with that. It's not a state issue. So, Dick, I appreciate your help. I don't like the idea that they will force us into certain kinds of disclosures that we already do um, in a certain format because I think it does take away from local control. But I certainly the bill is in better shape as you described it today than when it was introduced. Thanks. Uh, we're, we're not done with it. We're not done with it yet. I think there'll still be some more improvement. Uh, Dr. Sopcich has a point. Dick, how did our Johnson County legislators that are on that committee, how did they um, vote on this? We have six uh, Johnson County legislators who uh, serve on the House Education Committee, and uh, four of the Democrats voted no to advance the bill. Uh, two Republicans voted to uh, send the bill out of committee. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hearing no other comments, sure. we'll move on to uh, Human Resources. Trustee Lawson. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. So in the January, a new business section of our last meeting, I asked for an amendment to our non-discrimination policy, and it was sent to our Human Resource Committee. It was to add the two words, gender identity. Uh, and so we had Tanya Wilson, who made a statement about that, saying the progress of it. And so right now, in March, it will be presented to the President's Cabinet for review, then the faculty. I will come back through HR and April and then go to a vote for the board. So I just wanted to give an update on that. Uh, and then we have quite a few um, recommendations, about 11 of them. So if it's okay with the board, if we do the vote as a whole, I would like to make some comments specifically about two policies that went out to bid. That was our employee group life insurance policy, as well as the employee 4013 plan contribution uh, went out to bid. Is that correct? Medical insurance and life. Oh, I'm sorry, I had that. Yeah, medical one right underneath it. Um, that went out to bid, and everything else was up for renewal. Uh, and so I would like to see if that's a possibility, and if any trustee is comfortable to remove one of the recommendations before we vote on a whole. Steve um, Lawson, if you would read uh, which one are you talking about, that, which ones are you talking about? Group dental, group vision, group life? Life and medical went out to bid. But you, you, want, to, you want to take all of these together, right? All the do a recommendation all and a vote for all. We, we've, right. we've done that in the past. Does any trustee want to discuss any of those issues? Uh, are there any unusual increases, decreases, changes to the plan? We had one decrease. What was it that came back from Blue Cross Blue Shield? It was actually a 3.8 yep. increase. Yep. But it was started out at 4 and we right. negotiated okay. down a little bit more. Yep. So uh, if you would entertain a motion in that regard, we'll... Uh, do you want me to read the recommendations? Uh, I, I think if you uh, just hit the, the group name and oh, we'll take them as right a... Right here. Yes, yes. Okay. Which ones so you I just want to make sure they are in the board packet on page 1 through 10 um, that is published online. Uh, so a recommendation would be for the employee group uh, dental, and uh, employee group vision, life insurance, short-term disability insurance, uh, employee Benefits consult, uh, Consulting Services, Employee Assistant Plan, the Flexible Spending Account and HRA Administration, the Flex Benefit Funding, Employee 403B Plan uh, Contribution, and the Employee Group Medical Insurance and Salary Increases for Fiscal Year 2020. And so is your motion then... Uh is your motion then as recommended uh, in the narrative for each of those? Correct. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I would just point out, and I know that, <coughs> that Becky and Jerry and our staff did a great job because our employees here, uh, <coughs> faculty, staff, administration are getting, the, there, were, there were virtually no increases. There was at least, I think, one decrease and a very small increase in the medical insurance in today's environment. Um, we, we did very well, and it's a tribute, I think, to the healthiness of the people on campus 
and our efforts to, uh, to, to be healthy and our efforts on wellness so that we can keep all of our insurance rates lower. Mm -hmm. As, Any other questions? As well as um, we, I went through the human rights campaign. I mentioned this last just, month. Just a minute. We haven't voted on them yet, so. Oh, it's just, just, just a part just, of the discussion. That's all I was saying. Oh, on one of them? On just the whole of what? Let's, let's vote on them and then come back to your human. I think our discussion relates to them. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Go it ahead. relates okay. to the corporation. Okay, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So the human rights campaign has a corporate rating index. Uh, and as we reviewed and researched all the um, companies, Cigna, Blue Cross Blue he uh, Shield, they all provide LGBT services with 100% scoring. So I just wanted to make that note. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions or comments on all 11 of those motions? Uh, the last one that was included is the staff, the recommendation for staff salary increases, which matches the collective bargaining, the master agreement for faculty. So that's really not a, not a healthcare benefit, but it's a, it's a raise for staff at 3%. Okay. Would you like to do that second? No. no. All in favor of those motions signify by saying aye. 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 Yes. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Trustee Lawson. Anything else from Human Resources? Uh, that concludes my report. Anything okay. else? Thank you. Learning quality. Uh, Mr. Snyder is traveling, I think, somewhere between here and there, and uh, Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the learning quality committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, February 4th, uh, here in the boardroom. The information related to the Learning Quality Committee meeting begins on page 11 and runs through page 27 of the board packet. Uh, the committee received six presentations, and tonight we have one uh, recommendation, albeit uh, multifaceted, in that recommendation. <clears throat> um, our first presentation was about faculty innovation in the classroom. There we heard from Professors Ty Edwards and Dan Owens, who described their work in aiding inter interdisciplinary learning by designing and deploying a learning community, uh, learning community opportunity between history and economics. Our next, uh, um, we received a sabbatical report from Professor Sarah Boyle regarding her research around teaching U.S. history from a global perspective. She described the approach uh, she takes in selecting materials and designing projects, as well as the impact uh, this has had on her classes. It, is also, it was also interesting to hear how she shared her research and the changes that she has implemented with her colleagues, uh, building a collaborative network with her department. That is a model for the effect that we hope all sabbatical projects uh, of this type we can have. Uh, the next. Uh, the next report was a committee, uh, the committee was given an overview of the CSIT, Computer Science, Information Technology and Cosmetology departments by Dean Sheila Maupin, Assistant Dean Deb Elder, and Coordinator Lana Hodes. Um, next, we re uh, regarding policy initiatives, Dr. Randy Weber, Vice President of Student Engagement, uh, brought forward a slate of policy modifications and updates that we have, that have been provided to you in the board packet in which we'll have a recommendation at the end of this report. Uh, fifth, we heard from Dr. Gurb Singh, who brought forward an affiliation agreement for clinical research, uh, I'm sorry, clinical experience partnerships that were also provided uh, for your review in the board packet. And finally, uh, Professor James Hopper uh, provided the rec re recommended curriculum changes voted on by the Educational Affairs Committee in January for the consideration, board's consideration tonight. And therefore, it is the recommendation of the Learning Quality Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve, as shown in the board packet, the following. Number one, deletion of following policy. Application of student policies, policy 301-00. Number two, modification of and combi combining into one policy, the credit admission policy, 310.01, continuing education admission policy, 310.02, and international student admission policy, 310.03, and then finally, the modification to the, to the following policies, 
Student Attendance Policy 314.01, Transfer Credit Policy 314.02, Grading System Policy 314.04, Honors Policy, dot, uh, I'm sorry, 314.05, Academic Standings Policy 314.06, and finally, Academic Renewal Policy 314.07, and I would make that motion. Second. Second. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, Trustee Lindstrom just gave a lot of information, a lot of reports, and I guess, uh, Dr. Weber, I might uh, have you correct my perception. Uh, as we look at these, we've been in a cleanup of, of policy for some time. Uh, uh, some of these aren't really major uh, changes other than language usage, but also uh, updating with certain uh, policies, federal policies uh, that, that we may have to live by. Is that pretty clear on my understanding of these changes? A number of those are kind of housekeeping item cleanups. A couple of them have some substantive change as far as uh, the way we support students and our goals. Okay. Any questions? Any questions, trustees? We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Trustee Lindstrom. Anything else from learning quality? No, Mr. Chairman. We adjourn the meeting at 9 a.m. on that day, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Management. Uh, Trustee Ingram is away, but on the phone. But I think Trustee Lindstrom, you're prepared to give that report on her behalf. I am. I'm pinch hitting twice. Um, Utility. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> the management committee uh, met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, February 6th, uh, here in the boardroom. That information uh, regarding the management committee begins on page 28 and runs through page 45 of the board packet. Uh, first, we heard from Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President of Finance and Administrative Services, who presented an agreement with the Johnson County Library for use of classroom space at Antioch and Gardner Libraries. This information can be found on the consent agenda on page 73 of the board packet. Next, we heard from Susan Ryder, uh, Director of Accounting Services and Grants. Uh, she gave a presentation on the college's financial fiscal health using financial ratios based on audited financial statements through the re most recent fiscal year, 2018. The report outlined how the college is using its resources, the areas of financial strength, the potential areas of improvement, and how the ratio analysis supports the college's strategic plan. Rachel Lears, Associate Vice President of Financial Services and Chief Financial Officer, I gave the monthly budget. She said that the budget development continues for the college for 2019-2020 fiscal year. A detail of that report will be made to the management committee on the meeting at April 3rd in advance of the annual budget workshop, which will be held during the board meeting on April 18th. Janelle Voger, uh, um, Associate Vice President for Business Services, presented the single source report as well as a summary of the awarded bids between 50,000 and 150,000. That summary is on page 39 of the board packet. Uh, Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President of Campus Services and Facility Planning, introduced Jeff Allen, who's the Director of Service, Campus Services and Energy Management, and Brett Edwards, Maintenance Supervisor. Mr. Edwards demonstrated the new building automata, aut automation system, or BAS, and reported that the upgrades made will improve building climate, reduce uh, energy usage, and improve analytics related to building mechanical systems. Mr. Hayes also gave a monthly update on capital infrastructure projects, and this report can be found on page 44. Next, Mr. Hayes uh, provided information on the current progress of the construction projects on campus. He reviewed the report on the financial status of facilities master plan, that report is in your packet on page 45. The, uh, the management committee has five recommendations to present this evening. The first is a recommendation for construction of a standalone garage for the oral health on wheels vehicle and the, and the addition of a storage space for motorcycles. Staff has made an initial, uh, staff made an initial recommendation for the standalone garage in our January management committee meeting. At that time, members asked uh, if uh, there were other needs that could be met by a building, uh, a, a standalone garage. 
and staff returned uh, with, uh, with the report that to the February meeting uh, with an expanded garage to address the need to store motorcycles used in continuing education motorcycle safety course. These motorcycles are currently stored, you may have noticed them, in shipping containers on the campus uh, grounds. Uh, the estimated construction cost for the expanded garage is $584,000, 800. Funding is available from savings within the career uh, and technical education building. And it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to proceed with construction of the standalone garage for the oral health on wheels vehicle in motorcycle storage from savings within the guaranteed maximum price for the career and technical education building. And I will make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? second. Ingram uh -huh. seconds. Uh, any discussion? So if I understand that correctly, uh, there will be no additional cost to the college that was planned on for the career and tech ed building. No, the, the, you, the, this funding for this is coming from savings exactly. from the CTE building, yes. Okay. Any discussion on that recommendation? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Uh, I, your, your, uh, I was a little delayed. I'm assuming that was for or against Nancy Ingram. I want to clarify. I think it was for. Being you seconded. For. Yes, thank you. Proceed. Mr. Mr. Chair Chairman, next uh, we had uh, the Financial Services Department has reviewed the cash reserve policies, which are 210 dash, uh, I'm sorry, 210.07 uh, of the accounting and auditing policies. And um, the recommended updates include an increase in the minimum general fund reserve balance and non-material non revisions to reorganize content and bring the current policy language based on present terminology and financial practices. Uh, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the modifications to the cash reserve policies 210 and I will make that motion. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Trustee Musil. I have one question, and then I, I would like to offer a fairly simple amendment, I think. Uh, but the question is, we, the policy is the drafted would say that we would maintain 25%, I don't know if Rachel, 25% throughout the year. Is that on an average? Because as I look at our chart, our low point is December 31 every year, and on almost every year that we have projected out, we would be less than 20% at December 31 at the end of the year. So when are we measuring the 25%? Throughout the year, so we look at so it. We a monthly it. average, or? Yes, we could do it that way. We'll look at it each month, we'll look at it at fiscal year end. Okay. Which, which we already do. This is really to update our policy which now says 10%, which we have exceeded for a long time for good reason. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my, my motion is simple. This is a, po this is a policy, and it's a policy objective, and I shared this with the, not Trustee Lindstrom, is not the, knowing he'd make the report today, and Chair uh, Cook uh, yesterday, and staff, that we ought to make, we shouldn't have this look like it's a mandate because we need flexibility to drop below it if on occasion if there are emergencies. So I would recommend that we, instead of saying the college will maintain, my amendment is to change that to read the policy objective of the college is to maintain. It simply gives us the flexibility um, as opposed to somebody looking at that as a mandate and complaining that we're below 25% at a particular point in time. Trustee Lawson, Trustee Cross, what are your thoughts about that discussion? Can you say your motion again? It would simply read, the policy objective of the college is to maintain a minimum general fund ba reserve balance throughout the year of 25%, as opposed to the college will maintain, which makes it sound mandatory, and people are confused, I think, if we ever drop below it, it would look like we were violating a policy as opposed to having a policy goal. So when you change the word to is to, how is that different? Well, the, the objective is to, as opposed to the college will. That would be okay. the, that's the distinction I'm trying to make. I don't think it's a big deal, but I think we get criticized for not following policies that say will or shall or must. 
Mm -hmm. This makes it more of a may, or our goal is to do this. So that's my only purpose. I had a mentor in the law that taught me to say, we'll endeavor to. <laughs> we'll endeavor to get you that discovery over right away. <laughs> Trustee Ingram, this is probably new to you as well. What are your thoughts? I don't have a second. I, I don't really no, I'll second. I'll second it. I don't. I made the motion. I'm sorry? I'm good with it. Okay. And, and, uh, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I made the motion, and... Uh, I, I read um, Trustee Musil's uh, friendly amendment, and I, I would agree with it too. So I'd be willing to okay. so change we, my motion. We have an to amendment that. to the original motion uh, to change the language, as Trustee Musil has indicated. That has received a second. Uh, Rachel, if you'd come to the podium for a second, I just want to talk a little bit about this. So, uh, going from 10 percent to 25 percent uh -huh. as a endeavor to throughout the year. Yes. What's, uh, what's the trend these days? I, 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 this is my 10th year on the board, and uh, I don't know that we've ever addressed the amount of reserve beyond 10%. Uh, I guess when I was in the public school business, we tried to have at least two months operating mm -hmm. and capital and reserve. Yes, 25% would then be three months operating, one fiscal quarter. And our, our trend really, our cash flow is is very different each month, and that's why, as I, we were saying, it's really almost a monthly test. You know, we, we um, our, our reserve balance is very significantly based on the timing of tuition receipts, the timing of ad valorem tax distributions, timing of state distributions. So we may be at that low point on December 31st, at that particular point in time, but as soon as two to three weeks later, based on tuition dollars in January and a tax distribution in January, we're up to 50 or 60 percent of reserves. So it's very cyclical, and again, this is a policy guideline to guide throughout the year. Okay. Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we received federal subsidy. That's why we went to Washington last week, I think, in part for the legislative summit. So we received federal monies in some form. Pell grants Pell and federal student loans. Right. Mm -hmm. How are those distributions made? Uh, the Pell Grant awards and the student loans go directly on student accounts. To so do they come? Pay off tuition balances, if you will. Uh, do they happen periodically or certain times of the year? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's mostly um, at the beginning of the semester, there's a schedule based on where we're at within the academic calendar, X number of days after the start of the term, the aid is distributed according to the federal guidelines. And I'm just asking, and I don't really want to make this political, I'm just, if a shutdown occurs, are we subject then to the shutdown delaying payments? Uh, we didn't have any delay in payments this January, if that's what you're asking. Yes and no. I just I don't quite know the logistics of how the payments will work. So I'm saying I think it makes some sense to have extra money laying around in case. That that's uh, completely different. The the issuance of uh, federal funds is what the students eligible based on um, completion of the FAFSA. That money comes to us based on the students eligibility. During the last number of shutdowns, we've never not had access to funds. We have had issues where the people who work in the agencies completing the FAFSAs and getting them returned to us in a timely manner may, may be an issue, um, but access to those funds, and that's, that would be difficult. So we would be in greater jeopardy if we didn't get a student's eligibility amount than actually the money, because um, we, that money is really, we're, we're kind of the pass-through. So it goes to a student, then goes to their tuition account, they get uh, over award to go toward their cost of living as well. Thank you for that, sorry. Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I mentioned earlier in my report that uh, Susan Ryder had made some comments regarding our fiscal health financial ratios, and uh, I asked a question in the in the management committee what impact this would have on those ratios, and, and I got a report back that was very satisfactory in my mind that this was the proper thing to do. Okay. I just have a process question. So this is the first time I'm hearing of an amendment, so I can't help but think about last month. So was this something of a process beforehand? If we have an amendment, do we turn that in so all the trustees know that this is something that we're going to bring up? Or is this a process where we can present amendments on the spot? Well, that's a great question. And I think one of the things we're always concerned about is uh, coma and how many trustees do we contact about any particular item outside of meeting 
So I think, just as I've indicated before, if, if a trustee has an item they would like to discuss to, to bring it to the chair's attention, in this case, he brought it, Greg brought, Trustee Musil brought it to the management committee. I did get an email about it yesterday, and being it was a language, it wasn't really a substantive change to what we're intending to do, uh, more, a pro, uh, more an item of what our attempt is to do. But it's a good question. I would still like to say that when we have Changes to the agenda, amendments to the agenda. We, uh, our policy is seven days in advance to the chair to change the to change the uh, agenda. And this really isn't changing an agenda as it is uh, amending a recommendation that's being made on the agenda. But your point's well taken. Well, I think the the issue last time was people felt surprised. I feel surprised. So I didn't know that this was an amendment that was going to be presented. I read the board packet the way it was. Right. So this is the first moment I'm hearing of this amendment. I have not had a chance to look at that. What does that mean if we change it versus objective, which is the way it was written? Good point. I, I, I apologize if this language change, I mean, it is an agenda item that's on there, and I don't know if, we, if I could have sent it to everybody. I think we're worried, all worried about too many serial communications, so I sent it to the chairman of the board so that he had notice of it, and to the chair, the person I knew was reporting to the, for the committee so that he had notice of it. I did not believe I could send it to anybody else. It is not a substantive amendment, and I apologize for any surprise caused to my fellow trustees. Well, I, I think, again, how I perceived it, Trustee Lawson, was that it, it wasn't, a, wasn't a change in the agenda, a new agenda item, as it was an amendment to a recommendation. I guess if you feel that you're not comfortable with, with that amendment, you can vote no on that amendment. And, uh, but I, I don't really regard this as a substantive change to the intended recommendation originally. Okay, so I just want to be clear. So if I have an amendment that I want to put forward, I don't have to make notice. I think you, uh, an amendment to a recommendation is fine in a meeting. Tanya, you have a comment? So much on the floor is allowed. So at this point, from my perspective, Trustee Musil has made a motion to amend the pending motion on, that's on the table. And we need to vote on that first and get a majority vote. And then if that passes, then you'll vote on Trustee Musil's amendment. If it fails, you'll revert back to the original motion. But, but I just want to understand to, the to answer Trustee Lawson's question. Uh, any trustee can make an amendment to a recommendation that's on the board and we vote on it as we normally would and if it fails then it fails and if it passes it passes. My point a month ago was changing the agenda with a new item all by itself and so. Sure. I would, Tanya, if you could put out an email to us as to how we could sure. communicate this. I assume if we go through your office or the chairs then somebody can distribute it to everybody. I just wasn't sure or comfortable that I could do that to all six other trustees without getting in uh, a bind with the Kansas Open Meetings Act. So, because it's certainly not my intention to surprise anybody. So, we're voting on the amendment first. Tanya, is that correct? And the yeah. amendment is that, would you like to repeat the language again, Greg? The amendment would start the policy to read the policy. It's a second paragraph of the recommendation. It would now read, the policy objective of the college is to maintain a minimum general fund reserve balance throughout the year of 25%, et cetera, instead of the college will maintain. Okay. That has received a second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Is you, is you, are you a yes, Nancy? <laughs> Yes. yes, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but there's a little delay in the phone, and so, and I go way too fast, so I just want to make sure. I'm trying to work on communication. And now on the motion, on the motion of the recommendation originally made by Trustee Lindstrom, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Trustee Lindstrom, proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have uh, now for the third uh, item I have for a recommendation. Um, there were three recommendation, uh, re recommendations based on bids. The first war was um, a bid for bulk fuel, and it is the recommendation of the ma management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of McEnany Oil Company 
at an estimated annual expenditure of $60,000 for this second of four, um, four option years and $120,000 for the remaining two option years for the total estimated expenditure of $180,000, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Proceed. Uh, the next bid is for the purchase of necessary HVAC and electrical training systems and associated equipment for the use for the new construction classrooms uh, within the new career and technical education uh, CTE building. Um, first of all, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve proposals for their one-time purchase of, from Hampton Engineering Corporation for Hampton brand training systems in the amount of $363,910 in innovative education systems for Festo brand training systems in the amount of $91,140,000 for a combined total of $455,050, and I will make that motion. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> the final bid is for roofing replacement and roofing recovery on the gymnasium building, industrial training center building, and the warehouse building. Therefore, it is the recommendation of the ma uh, management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of college administration to approve the low bid from Premier Contracting Incorporated in the amount of $616,884 with an additional 10% contingency of $61,688 to allow for possible unforeseen cost uh, for a total expenditure not to exceed $678,572, and I will make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Nancy Ingram seconds. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Um, any, uh, let me just surprise everybody. Uh, um, <laughs> Dr. Sopchik, uh, being we're talking about the, all this management and buildings and so on, uh, unless it's in your report, the FADS is, is open. Uh, construction on CTE is going well. You're, you surprised me on that. Um, Rex, can you give us a little update on FADS building and CTE? Yeah, well, as you know, the FADS is not building. We moved into the, uh, the building and we're holding classes there. Still a few punch list items to complete, but, you know, just educational process is continuing there. And the Career and Technical edu Education building is certainly on schedule and it's moving along fine and we'll be uh, ready for classes. <coughs> I was probably going to say this at the end, but I'll say it now. Uh, in, in light of all of the construction going on and all of the changes in traffic flow and so on, Rex, I just want to commend the, uh, the, the staff on the weather control, cleaning sidewalks, driveways, all of that. I know that's really been an extra charge of the people, and uh, uh, you, you guys have really done a, a terrific job, at least from my perspective, so thank you. Ice is hard to handle, but thank you very much for that. Your Rex, when he talked about the FADS building, being able to move into the FADS on the timeline that was established was really a Herculean effort by, by faculty and staff to make that happen. A lot of folks came in over break, um, and in the end, it seems to be, be working out okay. I know there's still a few little things to do, uh, but it was an incredible effort across the board. President's recommendations, Treasurer's report, Trustee Musil. Does Hercules know what FAD stands for that we could share with everybody? <laughs> Fine Arts and Design Building. Yeah, that's good. You know my hatred of acronyms that citizens watching don't know what it means. Um, so it's a very impressive Fine Arts and Design Building, and it was a Herculean effort. Thanks, everybody on staff. Um, the board packet contains a treasury report for the month ending December 31, 2018. It starts at page 52 of the board's report. Some of the items of note are page one, 
is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. December was the sixth month of the college's 2018-2019 fiscal year. An operating grant payment from the state of Kansas of $10.6 million was received in January and will be in next month's report. An ad valorem property tax distribution of $54.7 million was received in January and will be included in next month's report. The college's unencumbered cash balance as of 12-31-18 was $58.5 million, which is about $8.1 million less than last year at the same time. And all of the expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. And with that, it is the recommendation of the college administration that the board approve the treasurer's report for the month ended December 31, 2018, subject to audit, and I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are you there, Nancy? Yes, aye. Uh, opposed? <laughs> motion carries. I scared her to death. Uh, monthly report. It's very muffled, I apologize. Sorry. Uh, President's report. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, in light of the events over the past week, I'd like to share with you a, a, a statement. Um, as many of you know, on Wednesday morning, February 13, Trustee Lawson and I were in a restaurant and our conversation evolved to the two of us rehashing our positions with respect to the student tuition increase of $1 that the board approved for the 2019-2020 budget or 2020 academic year. It was a spirited dialogue on the issue, and very soon afterwards, phrases attributed to me were posted on social media. Anyone who knows me or has watched me over my 27 years here at Johnson County Community College knows my passion for this college and our students. You would also know I enjoy a spirited debate or a lively discussion on the issues, and this is what occurred a conversation on an important topic that portions were taken and posted with no context. In doing so, this posting has the effect of making a statement of intended hyperbole sound like a statement of belief. The resulting narrative from these points is unfortunate because I am a leader who does care about our students, especially those who are struggling due to financial hardship. People can and have condemn certain decisions I've made during these six years in office. This type of treatment comes with the position. But in this case, to be accused of neglecting students who work so hard, to be accused of being insensitive to their needs, demands a response. This particular attack is not just on my decisions, but attacks on my character. I recognize and embrace the diverse population we serve. I also realize there are real struggles that students and families face daily. I've spent the better part of my adult life helping those I am now seen as minimizing. In this regard, I'm absolutely willing to stand behind my years of work and service. Before coming to Johnson County Community College, I worked for one of the largest social service agencies in Chicago, raising money for case managers, summer camps for kids, and legal assistance for the poor. I also worked as a fundraiser in an historical museum to bring the arts and history to disadvantaged youth in Chicago and, and after moving here to Johnson County, spent 17 years working as director of our college's foundation and raised millions of dollars to benefit students and provide those in need with the opportunity to attend our college. Johnson County Community College has been a leader in championing and supporting student-focused initiatives while I've been president. These initiatives are never accomplished by one individual, but are the result of our college culture that is caring and compassionate for all our students. Please allow me to share a sampling of these initiatives. Since 2013, we've dispersed an average of over $1 million in scholarships every year. 2019 is set to exceed 1.3 million. We've held tuition and fees flat at $93 a credit hour for three years. Just recently, the board approved an increase of $1. Over the four-year span, this equals, this, this equals an increase of about one quarter of 1% in student tuition fees since 2017. We offer the third lowest cost per credit hour among the 19 community colleges in Kansas. We're expanding our longtime food pantry and two-year-old meal share program. 
Currently, we are in talks with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Kansas City to further bolster funding and awareness of food insecurities among our students. We're exploring a key initiative in the 2019-2020 budget that would assist students with their transportation needs and in the process, help us provide greater access to those who want to come to our school. We've infused $40,000 into the Counseling Center Hardship Grant from an unrestricted plan gift realized by the foundation. We've sought and received a federal Child Care Access Means Parents in School Grant, which provides about a little over $100,000 over four, a year, over four years, in child care assistance to the users of our child care center. One student that received this recently shared her story about how she was now able to move out of the shelter because she no longer had to pay for child care while she is in school. And we are actively exploring, exploring with the community a college promise type program to help those attend school who ordinarily may fall through the cracks, can't afford college, and don't benefit from a college-going culture in the home. We have already held several meetings with our K-12 superintendents and their teams, and we will be conducting a meeting in March with community leaders to discuss the merits and feasibility of this program. Rest assured, the example I've, I've shared represents a small slice of the significant effort that is made here every day to help our economically challenged and all our students succeed. And succeed they do. Believe me, I know, because as president of this college, I have the privilege to share these heartwarming success stories throughout our community. As for myself, please know, I am fully willing to be judged by the facts of my decades of service to this college and my community and the good works we do together every day. And on that, I will stand. Thank you, Dr. Do Dr. you Bowen. have any other items in your report? That's it. Today? Um, I, I would say that, and I hope the board, uh, thank you for your remarks. I, I hope the board would refer to the pages of of report each month we get. And uh, I think, Mr. Scarlett, you're still in the audience. One of those pieces of that report was an update on the CLEAR project, so I'm, I'm hoping that the CLEAR that you were involved with years ago is the same CLEAR project that we're working on today. And you'd be proud to know the number of, I think there was over 470 students or something and 50 some different kinds of courses. I've attended that CLEAR project and uh, uh, thank you for her mentioning that in your, your remarks. It's a terrific, terrific program. But again, there are several pieces of good news uh, that staff and faculty put together in that monthly report, and I thought it was coincidental that you would talk about that, and it was part of our report. Uh, any, um, uh, I don't know if you want comments at this point with respect to the President's uh, remarks or not, or if it's um, later in the program. I'm let's, let's, uh, let's do that later. Yeah. If, if need be. Uh, any old business? Any new business? <laughs> any new business? <laughs> any new business? <laughs> uh, reports from Board Liaison Faculty Association, Dr. Harvey. Okay, well, we've had um, a very exciting month. We've actually had two faculty association meetings since I last stood at this podium. Both of them were very uh, contentious, really. Um, the positive of that is that it was a very well-attended meeting both times, a packed room. I think every seat was full. Uh, the negative, of course, of that is that um, the events that led it to be a full room, um, is just a, it shows uh, there's increased frustration and disappointment, and it hurts morale, the fact that that we had those kind of contentious things happen in the last, in the last month. Um, last month, we were primarily focused on concerns over whether or not a part of our contract would be honored. There was an email sent to faculty that day that was not well received. In fact, it was, um, there were a lot of people who were very offended and felt insulted by that email. Um, that situation was temporarily resolved, and I feel like um, we can move forward constructively, I hope. Uh, we have agreed to reopen the uh, Distinguished Service Award section of our contract, if assuming that everyone wants to do that. 
Um, we have agreed on our end that we're willing to do that to see if we can avoid the train wreck that happened in recent months with this part of our contract. So we're hoping that um, we're confident that we could come to some kind of um, changes and clarifications that would be mutually, mutually beneficial and we're willing to do that so we can avoid what happened. Um, I will say that when faculty are not confident that their contract is gonna be honored and followed every part of their contract, if we feel like it's gonna, we're gonna have to have a legal battle to get our contract honored, um, it really erodes any trust that we have with the administration, with the administrators, with the board even. So um, just something to keep in mind as we go forward. Today, um, we heard from um, the, we heard from Kate Allen. She talked about the foundation, many of the efforts that the foundation does to help our students, um, efforts that have opportunities for faculty to be involved. Um, we talked about sort of some of their ongoing things that are sponsored by the foundation. We heard um, many of the statistics and different things, that some of that Joe shared about our students from her. We heard some of the ideas in play to grow our emergency fund for students. And we also heard uh, some of ideas that are being considered for expanding our food pantry on campus. Uh, the food pantry here was started by Brian Wright and the Model UN students. And uh, the demand seems to be outgrowing uh, the supply and the, needs, and the needs that our students have, our student population. So there's, um, there's efforts underway to look at ways of expanding that. Uh, we discussed, we, then we discussed the comments shared in the news, and it was a lively discussion. Um, I do want to invite, oh yeah, if you'll, if you'll just um, indulge me for one second, I wanna give Bill like a minute to share a statement Okay. On behalf of the Faculty Senate, he tried to sign up at the beginning and signed the wrong list. So mm -hmm. is that okay with you, Chair? Uh, we, just to we, give him a uh, small bit of my... We will try and deal with that on staff development of how to sign that letter. But yes, Bill... Okay, all right. All right, come on up, Bill. This is Bill McFarland, and he is currently the president of our Faculty Senate, and he had a short statement that he wanted to read. And this is... Thank you, Melanie. Yep. Um, this is a learning experience for me, and so we're at the right place for that. Um, this is in reference to the, the news stories of the last week. Um, as in the Faculty Association, the Faculty Senate had a lively discussion about this, and there's two actions from our uh, meeting on February 19th. Uh, the first is a statement, and that is the Faculty Senate respects our student body and challenges they face, both personally and financially, in attempting to complete their education. Uh, the second is that the Faculty Senate will organize a special session to focus attention on college resources available to students who are experiencing financial challenges. It's important that we understand what support is currently offered by JCCC so that we can help our students to succeed both in and out of the classroom. During this meeting, we'd like to hear from students in an effort to identify any needs that are not being met and we've offered an invitation to the Student Senate, although the timing is that they haven't met yet, so uh, we hope to hear from them soon. And then finally, uh, we will propose or promote new lines of support to help them, the students, uh, meet any under-met needs. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Great, thank, thank you, you. Bill. Um, and I know that our, we did make a statement, and our statement was, uh, shared in the Kansas City Star, so I don't think I need to reread that for you. Um, but I do want to challenge the, color, the college leadership in two areas today. Okay, so uh, the first one is that I would just like to encourage you to exercise restraint in communication. And um, first of all, I wouldn't ever send an email if you're mad or frustrated. <laughs> Um, I, I'll be honest, I have a, a small team of officers. I have like, part of my officer group, I have three people, that before I send anything, I send it to them. And I say, should I take anything out? Should I add anything? And uh, if I'm really upset about something, I usually call Dennis Arjo and say, 
or, or Jim Liker and say, I need you to respond to this instead because I'm too mad right now. I think it's a good practice um, to not send out things that you haven't really thought about first because they can come off arrogant, there can be this indignation that comes with it and it's hard to take it back and it does damage to relationships. So that's the first thing. Um, I think, you know, if you're saying things in anger or in arguing that reflect poorly on our college and they get picked up, you know, those are also things that we don't want out there because it does damage to um, our college reputation. It's hard to take seriously when someone speaks about the needs of students if out in public record there are comments to the contrary. It just, it's, it's hard to overcome that. Um, the, the second challenge that I have for you is that I think we need to do a better job of understanding our students. It's hard to hear the comments that were read and not realize that it seems like there's a lack of understanding of our student population. I'm not denying that there's a history of providing some services for our students and doing some good things for them. But I still think that the place that those came from, the things that were said, recorded, documented, they still reflect a lack of understanding um, of our full population and what they experience, how many of our students experience these problems. And I think faculty and a lot of our staff and our faculty have the honor of spending their days getting to know our students. We're hearing and seeing the obstacles they face. We have a front row seat. And we see their challenges, they amaze us, they inspire us, and I know that not everybody in this room has that opportunity to see all of that. You hear anecdotal stories from time to time, you see a few that get letters written to you, but you don't see the day in, day out um, cross-section of our population. So I do, wish, I do wish you would have apologized for saying those things out loud. Um, but I do want to say that we need to do better. We need you guys to do better. We owe it to our students to, and we, to expect it from our board and administration. And um, I, I want to also add that just as an educator, I feel like there are some questions about our students I would like to see answered. For example, um, when you look, there are some studies out there. There's studies with league schools, but I don't know that we know some of these questions about our own students. For example, what percent of our students are single parents? What percent of our students have children? What percent of our students uh, are in school full-time and working full-time? What percentage of them are in school full-time and work multiple part-time jobs? <laughs> what percent face housing insecurity, homelessness, or food insecurity? Do we know the answers to those questions about our student population? I do think that one step to to educating ourselves about what our students look like, if you're not able to have a front row seat to all of that, is to find out the answers to some of those questions. We do know that the demographics in Johnson County are changing. Uh, one of my officers gave me this today, but she said that there's about uh, roughly 25.4% of the K through 12 in all of Johnson County, if you put it all together, qualify for free and reduced lunch. And um, to get free and reduced lunch, if you have a family of four, then you need to make $44,000 a year or less. So you think about that percentage, and we probably get more of those students than, say, KU or K-State or somewhere else. So I just think we need to, we need to be careful with our words because once they're, once they're said, it's hard to take them back. We need to be careful with, um, and not careless when we email or when we say things in public that could be picked up, how, regardless of the circumstances. And um, that's all I wanted to say about that, but I will add that I also did email the House Education um, Committee this week, and I uh, wrote on behalf of House Bill 2144 objecting to it, like objecting to it because I realized that it would be um, really, really harmful to this institution. And so I'm, I was pleased to hear in Dick Carter's report that 
they've taken out the, that financial piece from that. So that's totally random other thought, but I wanted to share it that I do, um, I did oppose that bill too. So. Dr. Harvey, a clarification. Yeah. You, you said that the contract had been violated. Is it in the Distinguished Service Award category that you're referring to when we used to have 10 awards for $10,000 and we were thinking of six awards for $10,000? Or what, what, what were you speaking of where the contract was violated? So we had multiple issues with the way that it was carried out from what's in the contract in the end. On that topic or several yes, topics? on that. Just that topic. But multiple issues with, within the process. So depending on who you ask, they would say there were a lot of parts of it that were kind of screwed up mm -hmm. along the way. Ultimately, um, I had filed a grievance and I had objected to the, um, there's a part in there that has always been interpreted from, the, we've had this probably 25, years or so. I'm not even sure how long we've had this award. But the way that it's always worked is that um, the, there's an external judge, and the judge is uh, tasked with following criteria to judge portfolios. And the judge is tasked with determining up to 10 awards who should win. And it's always been left to the judge to determine the number of awards. And this year, there was um, there was just a big train wreck of that. But in the end, our, our contract, in my mind, was at least to that extent honored as much as it could be. There was a lot of mistakes along the way, but I'm not going to go into all of in that. In that one area. In that and one I guess area. What I'm trying to clarify for mm -hmm. the viewing public is I don't believe, and when you talk about we need to be careful about comments we make, and you just said up to 10 could be awarded each year, the history has probably been 10 have been awarded, and therefore the assumption is 10 will always be awarded, but I think it does say up to 10. And, and I want the general public to know that that is a piece where faculty can apply for a Distinguished Service Award recognition for additional compensation, and it's not a, uh, a violation of the entire contract, but that one segment of it. But every piece of our contract is important to us. I understand. I understand that. So yes, there wasn't a violation of other parts of the contract. It was that one part yeah, of the contract. Thank you. Appreciate that. But it, in the end, we're I think we're pleased with how it ended this year. We're satisfied with how it ended this year for now. But it was such a mess that I don't think it's good for anybody if we repeat that. So that's why it is important that we revisit the details around that so that we can avoid the situation that we got ourselves into. Okay. Uh, Question, Trustee Cross. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Harvey. I appreciate you being here. I, I had not seen your statement. I guess I've read this partial statement that's in the Star, in the Star article. Uh, the statement reads in part, he did not dispute any of Reeves' factual content when asked if he wished to do so. Does this sound like your statement? That wasn't, that was a part of an email that we sent. Right. But our statement was towards the end of the email. Did you want me to? Well, I, that? I, the, the statement also advises faculty leaders not to form hasty judgments based on incomplete data and information from social media. Mm -hmm. That's also in the statement, right? Yes. Um, That's in the statement. But that essentially, you, you disavowed the statements because they're essentially insensitive to our students, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to understand that. Questions of Dr. Hart? Well, Dr. Cook, I, I'm going to make this comment, some of these comments later, but I agree with almost everything you said. We should be careful about what we say. Mm -hmm. And we should be careful about what we hear when somebody says something. Because context matters. You call the Di Distinguished Service Award matter a train wreck. That is a loaded term. Dr. McLeod worked hard on that, trying to figure out a way. And he might not, may not have done it perfect. And I know the Faculty Association doesn't think he did. But to call it a train wreck is saying something that you can't take back about a disagreement over an interpretation of the master agreement. And I don't know enough about it to know whether you were right or Mickey was right. But if we're going to be careful about what we say, and I, really, I would prefer we not be so careful, because what has come out of this comments this week mm -hmm. is, a, is a failure to have robust conversations on this campus. Because now everybody on this board 
and everybody in the administration and a bunch of people out here, including faculty members I've heard from, are afraid to say certain things, are afraid to use any rhetorical devices like hyperbole that we all learned about when we took rhetoric or composition or, or speech. Because if somebody lifts one comment out of that, it makes me look like I don't care about students. And I appreciated Dr. Sopcich's comments because he has a full career dedicated to students. He's raised more money than anybody else in the history of this college for students. And so I just want us all to be, I would rather have a robust conversation where I irritate you and you irritate me, but we have a full conversation instead of tiptoeing around items because we're afraid somebody's going to pull a comment out. I don't know how we get back to that. You and I can start that process. If, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. If And I... I will just say, I, didn't, I don't want to go into all the details when I said train wreck, but there's some items that I was referring to. For example, originally the wrong rubric was sent to the judge. One of the applicants wasn't sent to the judge. That applicant wasn't reviewed by the committee that was supposed to review them before they went. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> there, was, there were multiple things. When I say train wreck, I'm really not exaggerating in this case. There were so many things that went wrong, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because they because of the, the mistakes that were made. Part of that was the lateness of finishing our negotiations and the contract rolled out, and then these, there was deadlines associated with this award. And, but they, there were so many things. Uh, one of the people found out something about their ranking they should have never known. Um, it, there were a lot of little things that happened that the word train wreck, honestly, I'm not being, um, I'm not exaggerating here. It, it really was a mess, and we do really want to kind of polish up all that. I think everybody wants to fix that so that it just doesn't happen again. I don't want the staff or administration handling that award to be in the same position again. I don't want to be in that position again, and I don't want the applicants or the outside judge to be in that position again. So in response to that, that, that's what I'm talking about. Let me, uh, let me abort any further discussion uh, on solving this issue tonight. I would say, again, though, in collegial steering, uh, at least I feel good about having faculty senate, educational affairs, faculty association, and administration there. I thought we made some really good progress on the misunderstanding or the, not the full understanding of the student agency program, and we begin to talk about the frustration mm -hmm. with Banner 9. So I believe it's forums like that, rather than in a meeting here, uh, where we're trying to conduct a lot of business, that we can uh, have candid discussions about that. I think there's a, a positive, and a, a very positive note, with your comments regarding uh, yourself, Dr. McLeod, in the future, and how you can move forward and try to work this out. And I think with everything, with everything under the bridge, this is a, a great way to start that process. So I appreciate that perspective. Dr. Harvey, thank you. And I appreciate both of your commitments to understanding our students better. Uh, that, that is something that I think everyone up here is interested in doing and will move ahead. Thank you. Johnson County Education Research Triangle, Trustee Cross. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, this month, the uh, Research Triangle did not meet. Our next meeting is set for Monday, April 22nd, 2019. 7.30 a.m. at the KU Edwards campus. Um, that concludes my report. Wow, it's cool. <coughs> KACCT, Trustee Lawson. Lee, that was so fast, Trustee. <laughs> I Thank saw you. a number of your colleagues last night, uh, my former colleagues from KACCT, as Dr. Sopcich and I attended the Kansas Board of Regents dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the trustees that are on that board that I used to know, uh, uh, said hi for you and for uh, Trustee Ingram, you too, because you're uh, still secretary, I think. But in any event, please proceed. Mm, thank you. So the Kansas Association of Community College of Trustees, I'm a liaison for that. We have our first meeting um, March 7th at the Ramada Convention Center in downtown Topeka. Um, we were just in D.C. for the Association of Community Colleges, and that is a national legislative summit uh, that is designed to inform and educate community college leaders on federal policy issues that impact community colleges and students. We heard from members of Congress, leading political analysts on the current climate in D.C., uh, recent elections, and the legislative issues impacting community colleges. I was also appointed to a national committee for diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
uh, and that was a very exciting uh, committee to attend, and I brought back a lot of information, many that I shared with you. And recently when we had our um, meeting, it was very healthy discussion, so I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Um, they brought forward uh, a few issues that I believe working with our chair we can look at discussing here at the college. There are three in particular that I'd like to bring forward, and um, not now, but you know, we'll have a discussion about that. Um, first is working to provide a way for small, local-owned, women-owned, minority-owned businesses get in the door at JCCC. Often colleges make contracts that are so large that local and small business owners struggle to find a way to become a vendor. I think we can work to, be, to help be a better consumer of our local businesses. Uh, second, I think we can work on improving and building an anti-bullying program that helps students, faculty, administration, uh, board of trustees, and anyone connected to the college find a way to help with bullying issues. And finally, I think we can work on establishing an inclusion policy, one that can help build our shared governance, grow our community trust, and establishing a role for our students in the governance of JCCC. And that concludes my report. Very good. Any update uh, that you're aware of from KACCT regarding uh, Linda Fund's replacement? They're in the process. I have not. I have okay. not. Maybe, uh, maybe the answer. Nancy, do you know anything? Uh, Trustee Ingram, do you have any uh, input into that? Yes, I can go ahead. I can go ahead and give an update on that. I think the, the board is aware that the executive director is going to be leaving. Uh, she's retiring in the end of April. And as a result of that, it's the executive committee who is leading the charge in the selection of the new executive director. We um, did meet today. I sent my information to them. I did not have the report of that meeting, so I know there's a choice on applicants. Um, for four different applicants, I did not meet the requirements so that there is a to review. And we do plan to interview the new three and five candidates following the PCA. Thank you. Any questions of Trustee Ingram or Trustee Lawson, Trustee Cross? If I may, are we having a report on ACCT from last week or maybe didn't? That was it. That was it. Okay, yes. That is what you gathered from the meeting, the diversity meeting on Saturday? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Do you have anything else to add for ACCT and LS? Um, I, I worked in Washington. I, I, I love Washington, although I don't have Potomac fever enough to be there. Uh, it, was, it was a nice trip. I thank the college for, for sending us. I think Tiger was an excellent uh, choice. Uh, the delegation received us. Each, each of the senators uh, took copious time to meet with us. Um, I, I'm blessed to know Sharice Davids uh, fairly well, and, and uh, not to ramble here, but we were socializing with members of uh, a nearby community college in a different state, and uh, they were sort of dreading, frankly, having to go meet with their congressional delegation and staff, and mm -hmm. we are just in a wonderful position to command in-person meetings with our members of Congress, and I think that uh, we're extremely blessed to do that. Uh, I think this place remains uh, as it was when my family lived in a trailer and drove down K-10 from Lawrence, Kansas to come to this college, the, the shining jewel of Johnson County. So I think we're in excellent shape, and um, I had a blast. And then uh, I actually left early. I've been traveling, so I talked to Dr. Sopcich about leaving early. So I left early Tuesday evening, and I appreciate uh, the college's flexibility. So. You might mentor Tiger about Potomac fever. I think he's got it, and you might help him. It Good rains time. there all the time. And so I said to people, I was told, you either fall in love with the rain or you get out, and you'll note that I got out. Yeah. Um, I know Trustee Lawson and Trustee Cross have challenged us on the federal lobbyist, but you just said a key word in terms of we're held in high regard by our delegation. And I, I still maintain that uh, while it's good to go there and be with them, uh, our, our efforts that we do every day home with staff, of their staff here back in Kansas, really pays lots of dividends yes. as well. And so to get to know that staff and to work with them is, is really critical. Before you make your comment about that, I would say last night, Dr. Sobchik and I had a chance to go to the Kansas Board of Regents annual dinner where they have the president and the chair. And when you talk about high regard at the federal level, um, I think it's important for the community and certainly the audience here to know tonight that when you got the Johnson County 
a community college name tag on. Yes, uh, we're, we're blessed in many areas with uh, assess valuation and our financial resources, our staff. Uh, but, but for them to come up and say, you know, we really hold your college and staff, faculty, teachers, everybody in high regard, uh, and we know you're one of the best in the nation. So, uh, Trustee Lawson, it was when I said I was with your colleagues last night, and it was the Board of Regents, I think, input and other presidents and trustees that say, hey, we kind of like to be like you guys. And we sometimes forget that when we deal with issues that need to be dealt with, but are of uh, uh, they're not capturing the big picture that goes on every day. And we, we just have so many great things going on every day here. I appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. I would, um, we've, we've all talked about the, the success of those visits. I'd just like to recognize Kate Allen. Kate's the one who orchestrated those visits in a very small window to pull that off. And the fact that we not only got to meet with staff, but also the, the, our two senators and, and congresswomen um, is, is really commendable. So it was a nice, nice job. Just for those Thank keeping you. score at home, who's Kate Allen? <laughs> yeah, that's an that's a acronym, Kate Allen. I don't mean to correct you. I'm just saying people don't know. Who Kate oh, Allen. Kate Allen is our um, associate vice president of... Kate, what's your full title? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Thanks for all you do. Appreciate it very much. Speaking of Kate Allen, we go to the foundation report. Trustee Musil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The foundation board met on January 16th and discussed multiple topics, including participation in the ribbon cutting and the uh, dedication of the new fine arts and design studio uh, building, FADS. Uh, the foundation approved moving its annual luncheon from May to April 26th, the date of the ribbon cutting. All trustees are invited, and I'm sure Terry will have it on our April calendar. Uh, 11.30 to 1 p.m. in the FADS courtyard with the rib ribbon cutting and dedication immediately following at 1.15. That's on April 26th. On February 28th, the foundation's winter social will be held from 4.30 to 6. We're hosting this event in conjunction with the Overland Park Chamber and the Olathe Chambers of Commerce. The featured topic is the fine arts and design studio, there will be a social held in the Capitol Federal Conference Room in the Rainier Center uh, with a small group tours of fads leaving every 15 minutes. And again, all trustees are invited to attend. That is next week, February 28th, a week from today. Um, and finally, please enjoy the custom chocolates as a late Valentine's Day present from the foundation. They were produced in partnership with Christopher Elbow and faculty chef Aaron Prater through our Wiley Hospitality and Culinary Academy a JCCC alum currently employed at Christopher Elbow Chocolates produced these custom gifts for the foundation. They've been a hit with donors and volunteers. Um, thank you all for your continued support. And I will donate this to the first person in the audience that gets up here after the motion to adjourn is passed. <laughs> and I don't need this. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> That's well, all I have. What I was going to do with mine, but you've, you've kind of superseded me, was there, I, I recall a story where there was a gathering of people and they didn't, it appeared that there wasn't enough fish or bread, and uh, they they Let's turned it in. So I would, I would take my little box and uh, and have you each come up and get a piece and see if we can't have enough for everybody. <laughs> but uh, we'll see if we can work that out. That's why, he, that's why he's chairman. <laughs> uh, the last item on our agenda is the consent agenda. It's a time when we deal with a number of items uh, in one motion. Uh, I would entertain a motion to. Um, uh, approve that consent agenda unless a trustee would like to pull an item off. Is there like any to, item to pull off? I would like to pull one off, please. Uh, grant that comes under the consent agenda. Is that item right? number three? Yes. Grants, contracts, and awards will pull off. Any others? I would entertain a motion to approve those that are left. I approve. I so move. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any questions? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Item three of the consent agenda, grants, contracts, and awards, Trustee Cross. It, uh, item number three under the grants, contracts, and awards, it's a testing the all nation snuff out smokeless tobacco cessation program for the efficacy grant. What does that mean? Anybody speak to that? Um, yeah. Melinda. Melinda. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, this is through the uh, Center for American Indian Studies, Sean Daly. Um, this is a grant that he's had over the past five years, and he is reapplying for this. Sean Daly is still here? Uh -huh, he is. Okay, great. Yes, and so this is work that he does um, at the various um, Indian reservations um, in the state of Kansas. 
um, both in urban as well as rural. My mother died of lung cancer, so this one caught my eye. Mm -hmm. um, does this mean it's approved, the amount requested? No, it's just been submitted. We, we've applied for we've it. We've applied yeah. for I've it, yes. Because uh -huh. oh, we've had it. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any other discussion? I move we approve the grants portion of the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, I would, uh, again, I, I just want to make a comment, Rex, to all of your staff for the good work. And I know it's a lot of hours to clean this campus and get it ready for, for uh, classes. And I know that when we start late or delay, it causes lots of lots of challenges and adjustments, and so I appreciate the patience of everybody in dealing with our, with our weather conditions. I found it interesting. I live in a neighborhood with a few middle school age students, and they're starting to, they're starting to uh, mumble that they wish they could get back to school because they're, they're not, they don't like missing all these days of school, so I guess it goes around, doesn't it? I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Non-debatable. There isn't one motion, though. Ingram motions, is there a second? Cross seconds. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. I didn't say anything. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.